we're going to talk about authenticate your users with Angular. And uh, just a little introduction um, of myself. Uh, I'm Simona. Uh, I'm currently located in Dublin. I come from Romania. And uh, I'm a full stack engineer. Uh, until recently, I used to build um, data analytics platforms normally with AngularJS and uh, Java and AngularJS with TypeScript. I'm also very passionate about communities, and because of that, I'm a co-organizer of the AngularJS uh, Dublin Meetup, and I'm also a strong advocate of women in tech, and it's actually refreshing to see um, so many women at Code Europe. Uh, you'd be surprised to learn that Western Europe has actually uh, less women in tech. We haven't found wh why yet, but still, it's nice to see so many women here. And practically, I'm part of uh, Women Who Code. I'm also, uh, I've been mentoring at NG Girls. And uh, just to let you know that um, in September, uh, a new workshop of NG Girls is going to happen in Warsaw. So if any of you is interested in helping, please let me know and I'll, I'll, um, I'll make sure to keep in mind that. Okay, so um, authenticate your users with uh, Angular. Uh, just a quick disclaimer here, even though uh, the title says authenticate your users with Angular, I'm actually, the, the principles that we're going to talk here uh, can apply to any other frameworks and it's not going to be an extensive talk about Angular, it's actually going to be uh, more generic. And whenever we think about authentication, uh, it's actually a complex subject which can cover, uh, which, or which should cover um, more topics. And in particular, we should definitely look into session management. And uh, there's two, there's more ways of doing session management, the two, but two of them are the traditional way, which probably 90% of us were doing a few years back. And then there's also the JSON Web Tokens, the newer way, which is uh, with JSON Web Tokens. And then uh, obviously, uh, when you think of authentication, you need to think of security as well, because um, that's important for your users. And also, um, authentication requires a client side most, in most cases. So it's here that we're gonna touch just a little bit of Angular. And um, the, we're gonna start with a small diagram of how this works from uh, the browser and um, server's perspective. So uh, the process starts with browser sending off a bunch of credentials, usually in the form of a username and password to the server. And then the server goes ahead and verifies whether the username exists, uh, if the password matches, and if everything's successful, uh, the server goes ahead and uh, creates a new session ID, which normally is a random string or a random number. And uh, it persists that in a session store. And from there, it goes ahead and retrieves some user data, fulfills the request, and sends back the session ID in a cookie um, to the client. And then uh, every following request will actually uh, include that cookie, uh, that session ID in a cookie. And uh, on the server, we're just going to uh, check if the session ID exists, we're gonna retrieve the user data, fulfill the request, and then um, send the response back to the client. So nothing too crazy happening here, but we can already see that there's a few things, um, a few flaws. One of the most important ones is um, the fact that uh, we require stateful servers. And, um, Say, for example, um, your server which stores the session ID at some point needs to be restarted or loses its connection or power or whatever. So uh, we need a way to persist sessions because we don't want to log out the, our users every single time that uh, a restart has happened. And uh, there's also the case in which your application becomes much more um, 
popular, which is a great case, right? And uh, that means that you need to scale either vertically or horizontally, but as we all know, it's much more cheaper to scale horizontally sometimes. And uh, that means that uh, our servers uh, need to share state. And it just means that we, we need to find a way to do that, and it becomes much more, authentication becomes much more complex. Um, session IDs, as I said before, are just some random strings, which means that they actually have no meaning. There's no user data uh, stored in them. And every single time we are, um, we, we, we make a request that needs uh, the user to be authenticated, we'll have to go query the session store and understand whether the user is, is, uh, the user is authenticated or not which means that we need to hit either the database or anyway do an extra lookup on the server, which is time that we should be spending on making our requests faster, faster for our users. So we have a performance impact. Uh, also, cookies are uh, limited to a single domain. So as you all know, um, cookies are stored per domain, like for example, app.com, any request for app.com will grab the cookie assigned to that domain. But then if you have um, another, like another API, api.com, you won't be able to reuse that cookie. Um, cookies are also CSRF susceptible. Uh, CSRF stands for cross-site request forgery, and we're going to dive into more detail about that um, later on, but you just need to make sure that your cookies cannot be stolen. Finally, um, you don't have great mobile support, so maybe cookies are stored in the browser, so maybe there is some support for cookies in some mobile browsers, but it's not that great, and then if you're implementing apps, you're left without anything, really. So definitely we need something better. And as of late, uh, the way to implement uh, session management is with uh, JSON Web Tokens, which as Ken C. Dodd said at some point, they're not your grandma's cookies. But a formal definition is JSON Web Tokens are an open industry standard uh, method for representing claims securely between two parties. So what does that mean in practice? It means that we have this weird looking string uh, which contains three parts. And as you can see, they're color coded here. Uh, so um, there's also a dot. They're separated by a dot. And each part has uh, its meaning and functionality. So the first part is the uh, header, the tokens header. And um, every single token has a header which contains claims, claims about itself. And this is normally in the form of a JSON object. And it contains uh, things like uh, the type of algorithm that has been used for signing the token, uh, which here is, oh sorry, here is HS256. And it also contains uh, the type of uh, token that we have here, and it's, in our case, is JWT. The second part uh, of the token is the claims or the payload, and it can contain, so this is the most interesting part of the token, because this is where you actually store your user data, and this is, uh, this can be very interesting for uh, different scenarios. And obviously, uh, there's nothing that, there's, there's no uh, field that's mandatory in, in this uh, part, but there's a few of them which have been included in the specification. And in our case, uh, for example, ISS stands for issuer, and it's practically a URI that identifies uniquely the party that has issued the token. In our case, simonacotin.com. And uh, there's also another uh, interesting claim, which is sub. And this uh, comes from subject. And it refers to the party that the, the token contains data about. And in our case, it's Simonaco. Simonaco. And uh, as I mentioned before, you can um, store different types of data that's meaningful for your application. 
And in this case, uh, you can have things like the, the name or even uh, have um, like authorization information. Like you can specify whether um, your user is an admin or not. And one thing that's, uh, that you need to keep in mind here is that uh, this string is actually base64 encoded, so it's not encrypted. So if I go ahead and take this string and um, copy it into any base64 decoder, I will get the string on your right, which means that we shouldn't store sensitive data like password or anything that is personal to our users or we don't want others to see. So that being said, what's the thing that makes our uh, token or makes us uh, trust the fact that our token has been issued by uh, the server, by our server? That's the signature. And there's different types of algorithms that can be implemented um, for signing uh, JSON web tokens. But the, the only one that's required by uh, JWS to be implemented is the HMAC SHA-256. And um, how we generate the signature is basically by encoding the header, appending a dot, and then encoding the payload, and then applying a secret, which is only known on the, on the server. So that will never be on the, um, on the client. And then we apply the algorithm, which I mentioned earlier is HMAC SHA-256. So this is pretty much everything uh, needed for generating the signature, and this happens on the server. So let's just see a quick summary of what we've learned about JSON Web Tokens. Uh, the pronunciation uh, or is very popular and very common to call them JOTS. I'm not really sure where that comes from, but it's definitely a thing. Um, JSON Web Tokens are not encrypted, so please keep in mind that it's very important not to store sensitive data uh, in your claims because they can be read. Also, claims uh, contain custom data, so feel free to store any user data in your claims. That's useful because that means that your server won't spend time on retrieving some of the user data. Um, JSON Web Tokens are now stored in local storage. They can also be stored in cookies, but uh, it's much more useful, like storing them in local storage has some nice benefits to it. And we still need, we need the server to generate and validate the tokens. If you want to look further into JSON Web Tokens, uh, go ahead and uh, go to jwt.io. And this is a website that the Auth0 team has implemented, and it's very useful for just playing around, like modifying the header, the payload, and maybe play with the signature. So from the browser client, uh, from the client server perspective, things are looking very similar to how they looked like in, um, in the cookies uh, example. So the browser sends again the credentials, but then the fundamental difference, oh, sorry. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, the server, uh, instead of going ahead and creating a session ID and storing it in a, a session store, uh, now goes ahead and generates a token. And then it sends that token back uh, as part of the this is really confusing. As part of the token, and uh, a token header. And then uh, with every uh, following request, uh, we are sending the token in the authorization header. Uh, maybe this looks familiar to some of you. Like this is the part that, yeah. This is how you define your header. And then the server, once it has received that token, it um, va validates it and um, gets the user data from the token and fulfills the request and just sends back the, the response to the client. Here we go. <laughs> so uh, we found our ideal solution, right? Or 
maybe in five years time it won't be our ideal solution anymore, but we're happy with JSON web tokens. And why is that? Well, first of all, it's because uh, as you've noticed, uh, we no longer need to store any state on the, on the server anymore, so uh, we can happily go expand our number of servers, we can do whatever we want. We just need, like on the server, we're just generating um, a string. And uh, also what's very important is that our um, application can now integrate with third-party applications and uh, they can use our public key and uh, verify that our user is authenticated. Much like, you know, when you're connecting to Gmail and then you're just uh, going to Google Photos, you'll be automatically uh, logged in. Another important point is that uh, JSON Web Tokens are mobile ready, and that's because they're uh, just strings, and everyone knows what to do with strings. You don't need any extra effort there. And then um, you can have multiple, you, you can have support for multiple domains. So for example, you, you can store your, you can have your, uh, static content deployed on static.domain.com and then you can have your API at a different uh, domain and that will work. Um, we no longer are susceptible to XSERF, but then we are vulnerable to uh, cross-site scripting, which is still bad. It's one of the most uh, critical security risks or common. And very important, uh, size is important and that's because um, you can get greedy because you can put all this user data in your token and you can add so much information, but then um, it's important to keep in mind that uh, your to token travels over the network with every single request, which means that the fatter your token it is, the harder, the, the, the slower uh, it will travel. <laughs> so you need to find a common denominator between uh, the um, most used information across all requests, and that's your best bet for what you should store in the token. And yeah, so um, apart from the session management part of authentication, we need to pui, put our uh, spy glasses and see how we can fix or maybe take advantage of the security issues that you can have when uh, we're talking about authentication. So one of the important um, um, publications or projects when talking about security is the Open Web Application Security Project, which is practically um, an online community which creates tools and content for um, security. And every three years there's this top ten uh, most um, common threats security threats, and as you can see here, uh, the uh, broken authentication and session management is actually on the second place, and then we have cross-site scripting uh, attacks and cross-site request forgery uh, in the top 10 uh, listed here. And what's cross-site scripting? Uh, it practically enables attackers to run JavaScript code uh, on your website. And that's because browsers are actually dummy and they tend to execute everything that's on, that's on your page. They, they, they actually trust that all the code that's, uh, that's in your page should be run. And um, a nice demo here comes from uh, Google. Uh, it's um, called Bladder Box. And um, practically, let's say that you want to test, like you heard this talk about cross-site scripting, and you want to test whether your favorite chat uh, has cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And you go ahead and you just enter in your input. This image source X, which is an invalid one, and then you handle the on error event with alerting the document.cookie. So a site that wouldn't, wouldn't be vulnerable to cross-site scripting wouldn't do anything. But then in this case, uh, our chat, favorite chat application actually has some issues and it will prompt, prompt it will alert your session ID. And 
that can be mitigated by uh, sanitizing your data on both the client and the server. So this means that um, your your code, like your text should your your code shouldn't be executed, or whatever user input has, it shouldn't be executed. It should be uh, read as string. And then another way to mitigate this, if you're using cookies, you should uh, use the HTTP only flag. Um, that might be bad because um, that means that your cookies won't be accessible from your JavaScript environment. Uh, and this requires you maybe to make some requests to ask whether your user is authenticated or not to your server. But it saves you from, cr from cross-site scripting attacks. We can also use the content security, we can enable the content security policy, which means that uh, you will whitelist all the scripts uh, that you want to be run on your web page. So whoever wants to run some random JavaScript or uh, some random HTML, you, it, it, that won't happen because it won't be in your list of uh, files. What about cross-request, uh, cross-site request forgery? What happens here? Uh, practically, an attacker tricks the user into visiting a different web page with malignant code that secretly sends a malicious request to your application's web server. That's a huge definition. <laughs> so in practice, what we have is poor Alice that's authenticated to a website, and then bad Mallory uh, that sends a link to Alice. And Alice, that trusts everyone, uh, will actually click, let's say, yeah, she has the link in the email and she will click on the link. And because she's already authenticated to, let's say, ing.com, <coughs> her cookie will be sent over um, with the request, which means that Mallory will be able to execute things like, where is it? Uh, target account number, blah, 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 and transfer a huge amount of money. <laughs> You'd think that this is a joke, but this actually happened to ING. And probably it was a lower amount of money, but still, it's kind of scary to know that this can happen. And how do you mitigate uh, cross-site request forgery? You just don't use cookies. So that's one thing. You can store your token in local storage, and you should be fine. Another way is to use the synchronizer token strategy in traditional apps, and that's, that means that you'll have a hidden input in your form, which is a um, random generated number or string that will be verified on the server. Uh, we can also uh, use the double cookie strategy in single page applications. So practically, you, would, you will have um, another cookie, uh, which is called uh, X um, cross-site scripting token or something like this. And uh, that will be attached um, to, your, to every request, and then the server will verify that um, it matches. And it contains, again, a random generated number. And uh, otherwise, you can t just time out your session cookie very quickly but that doesn't really prevent anything. It just makes it shorter lived. Okay, so then we've talked about uh, session management. We've also talked about security, and now we're up to the last part, which is how do you handle uh, authentication on the front end? And as I mentioned before, one of my favorite platforms, web frameworks, JavaScript libraries is AngularJS. And uh, obviously, AngularJS helps you with lots of these issues. So it provides built-in enabled by default anti-cross-site scripting and XSERF protection. And you have this service called DOM Sanitization Service, which takes care of sanitizing your data. And obviously, you can bypass this if you still want to. But ideally, you don't want to do that. Uh, also, there's the cookie XSERF strategy that I was mentioning earlier. And uh, practically what Angular does is automatically, if from the server we have this uh, double cookie, then Angular, it will automatically append it to, the, um, to, to every request. And 
when we're talking about authentication on um, on the front end, we need to ask ourselves a few questions. So first of all, we need uh, some kind of um, um, indication of authentication. Like we, we, we need to know whether our user is logged in or not. Even for simple cases like uh, we need to display a login button or a um, logout button depending on whether it's, it's authenticated or not. Uh, we also need to conditionally uh, hide or show some elements and that's like um, it's the same case as previously. Maybe you want to show a button, maybe you don't want to show it when the user is authenticated or even uh, you want to ask yourself, should my user, is my user allowed to view this path? Like, uh, at some point I was working on an admin panel and um, like an e-commerce application where I had an admin panel and a store or some products. And obviously uh, normal regular users are not allowed to the path that admin can, can view. And uh, Angular has this uh, newly uh, and improved router which helps you handle all those cases that I mentioned before through this new feature called guards. And one of them is uh, the can load guard. And practically, sometimes you just don't want to, you don't even want to deliver the code to the client if he's not authorized or if, if he's not authenticated. And how you handle this is by creating this, uh, this class, can load, can load guard, which is pretty much just like a Angular service. And you include that in a route, which has a path, a component that's going to load, and uh, this new thing called can load, uh, which is an array of guards. And as you can see here, we are implementing the uh, can load method, which practically uses our, our authentication service to figure out whether our user is authenticated or not. And if he is, we are returning true, which means that our uh, component will be loaded. Otherwise, we are just going to navigate to the home page or login page, and our, um, our component cannot be loaded. There's also another guard which is can activate, and uh, this is the most common way of uh, implementing permissions. And uh, practically, this will load your code, but it just won't allow you to navigate to a certain component or a certain page. And it's just as uh, the can load page, you have the injectable uh, class, and you implement the can activate method, and the code is exactly the same. And a uh, third important guard is can activate child, which is exa does exactly the same thing as can activate, just that it refers to child components. So that's pretty much everything that I wanted to share with you guys. So just to keep in mind, we have three things that we need to consider. Uh, one of them, when thinking of authentication, uh, one of them is uh, how do you do session management? The second one, very important, how am I dealing with security risks? And the third one, how can I allow my user to safely navigate my application? So we've learned a bit. And just the conclusion, JWTs enable you to implement modern, scalable applications. Uh, cookies can be evil uh, if they're not implementing, implemented the right way. And then uh, Angular is your friend, definitely. Uh, it has out-of-the-box features which can make your app more secure. And you should definitely leverage the Angular router uh, for navigating your application securely. I hope this was useful. <laughs>